Okay, um, welcome back. Hope this uh, week is starting well for you. Um, this week, we're going to get into the final days of Jesus' life and his death and um, actually start getting to uh, the early church. And that will set us up for looking at the development of crucial doctrines in the, um, in the later uh, periods of the church, doctrines that are still held to be extraordinarily important, new creation, implications of uh, the resurrection, and um, of course the incarnation, and the trinity. And then that will set us up for the last week, which we'll be looking at um, the church today, and particularly its um, ethical and moral dimensions, and then at what's es called eschatology, or study of the last times. And that will lead us right up to the end of the story. So we've, we're, we're getting through the story. Um, uh, we're right now, we're still in um, Act 6, which is redemption. Um, and then we'll be uh, getting into reestablishment and restoration. So we are, uh, we are, we are, we are, we're tr trucking along. Um, so it might be good to remember a few things about um, Jesus' uh, ministry. So Jesus is, um, he is, uh, claiming to be Messiah. Now I want to I want to clarify something. Um, some of you, a lot of you got confused on this question uh, from the quiz for last week, which is, is Jesus unique because he claimed to be Messiah? No, Jesus is not unique because of that. Remember, we talked um, two weeks ago about how there were dozens of messiahs uh, leading up to and after Jesus' time. We spent a, a, a significant amount of time talking about um, Simon Bar Kokhba and the um, last uh, revolution, Simon Bar Kokhba claiming to be Messiah, um, supported by Rabbi Akiva in uh, 132 to 135 AD, and that led to Rome uh, raising Jerusalem, changing its name and dispelling the Jews, and they weren't allowed to enter back into Jerusalem for um, centuries. And this was also when the second temple was destroyed. It still has not been rebuilt. So Jesus is not unique in that he claimed to be the Messiah. It is that Jesus is unique for historical reasons because he's the only one that still is present in cultural memory and because he has an entire religion dedicated to the belief that he actually was the Messiah. There is no other claimants to the Messiah that have that behind them, not that I'm aware of. And if they are, they're not that significant, certainly not as significant as Jesus. So it is not true that Jesus is unique because he claimed, but rather, as Christians would say, Jesus is unique because he was and is Messiah. And so part of Messiah is he's proclaiming this kingdom of God. And Yet, it's not like people have been expecting. It's not the kind of kingdom of God that glories in the powerful and the rich. You know, um, in the ancient world um, and in, Jewish, uh, in the Jewish ancient mind, if you were rich, it was a sign that you were blessed by God. Um, so for Jesus to not be, um, to, to be critiquing the rich and the powerful is very strange. Um, if you were a Pharisee or a teacher of the law, you are one of the holiest people. Jesus is saying, no, they're not. They're hypocrites. I mean, it's just really funky stuff. And of course, it's making all those with political and religious power angry. And um, of course, uh, that, that, that buck stops with Rome, where uh, political, political dissents, political, um, um, political, what's the word I'm looking for, um, um, sort of rumblings that are anti-Rome or even slightly anti-Rome, certainly a guy claiming to be Messiah, claiming to be king, that's going to get Jesus in some trouble. And so one of the first, or one of the major things is not only is Jesus not seeming to be this warlord Messiah, but he's talking about himself in really weird ways, ways that are so strange of the concept of Messiah that 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 the, the disciples literally do not know what he means. And it turns out he means exactly what he says. So Luke 9.51 is this part. So there's this moment leading up to the Passover 
and we don't know exactly how long, but it says that Jesus sets his face resolutely towards Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem. And at this time, he starts to predict that he's going to die when he gets there. And even predict he's going to raise from the dead. But most of the time, he's just saying he's going to die. And as we've talked about, uh, the disciples don't get it. They don't understand because messiahs don't die. That doesn't make any sense. And we talked about even Peter comes up to Jesus and says, this isn't going to happen to you. And Peter and then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're not speaking of the things of God, but of men. And so they're still waiting for this commonly expected Messiah, this, this warlord king who is going to uh, restore the kingdom of Israel, uh, beat everybody down and out, and um, have this everlasting kingdom. They're not expecting a guy to go and die. And not only die, but die one of the most humiliating excruciating and um, politically um, defeating deaths that one can die in ancient Rome. But we'll get to that in the next lecture. So, it is the time of Passover. That is when the Holy Week begins. Now, Passover is, um, as we've talked about, uh, or excuse me, Passover is the most important Jewish holiday, except for possibly Yom Kippur and Hanukkah, um, and that's because it celebrates the Exodus. Remember, as we talked about, the Exodus is the most important event in Jewish history. Um, it is the event that solidifies uh, God's calling of Israel and solidifies that they are Yahweh's people and gives them the law by which to live. All right. So the Exodus Moreover, in, in even with that and all of that, is also the, 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 the sign and the promise that God will rescue them from captivity. So Exodus stands as this kind of symbol for the end of exile. You know, um, for, for the Jews in, in the time, in Egypt at the time, it was the end of slavery. Well, now they've been in exile for centuries, you know, 500 years or more. And so they start to see Exodus as a symbol of God coming back and relieving them from exile. They've been praying and waiting. And Messiah is crucial to this. Remember, Messiah is the one who's going to do this. Messiah is the one who's going to come back, fulfill the covenant, and bring, uh, bring Jerusalem and Jews, uh, the Jews and Israel back to, uh, the king, to the rightful place in the kingdom of God. They will no longer be in exile. They will no longer be slaves, so to speak, of the kingdoms of the world. And so Exodus um, and exile are fueling how they're understanding Passover. And in fact, uh, in Jerusalem, where many people would travel to do sacrifices at the temple for the Passover, was extremely tumultuous because in the mindset um, if Jesus, or excuse me, not Jesus, if Messiah is going to come, if Messiah is going to declare himself, this is going to be the time to do it. Um, it would be similar to, you know, let's say um, America was was uh, invaded and taken over by a hostile country, and uh, you know they they were they controlled us and they had soldiers walking around. Well. You might think that the 4th of July would be a really, really, that'd be the time when, you know, more armed forces are on the ground and everybody's kind of tense because if there's going to be a revolt against this, you know, unwelcome invading um, country, army, government, whatever, that would probably be the time to do it because that's when people are going to have the most sense of patriotism. And so in a similar way, Passover kind of is this, this moment that would that most binds the people together around a single vision, which is they are God's people, they have the law, they are meant to be his kingdom. And so there's more Roman soldiers in uh, Jerusalem at this time than any other time of the year. There's more Jews in this. Uh, there's just more people in Jerusalem at this time than, than um, any other time of the year. In fact, uh, Josephus, a Jewish-Roman historian, said there was a million Jews in Jerusalem, you know, which is certainly an exaggeration. I think, I mean, I've never been to Jerusalem, but I've, I've seen a lot, read a lot, and I know a lot of people have been there. And I think if you had a million people in Jerusalem, it would, in the, in the old Jerusalem that um, 
with the wall around it on top of the hill. I think that would be people like standing on each other's heads or something. So it's just, you know, he means there's a lot of people. There's a million of them. Uh, but anyway, so this is really everything. It's, cr it's really crowded. There's a numerous amount of sacrifice going on. There's a lot of religiosity, a lot of kind of like patriotism. That's a modern concept, but there's a parallel in that Jews are very, very, very pro-Israel in more intense ways than they normally are. And so it's the most expected time for Messiah to be declared, for there to be revolt. Everyone's on edge. It's just a really crazy time, right? So at the beginning of this week leading up to Passover, Jesus does something called uh, called the triumphal entry. Now, triumphal entry is is a, it's it's not um, it's not it's a it's a common act of conquering kings. So the Romans practiced this. Um, when the Romans, when the emperors or the or the or the generals or whoever were kind of um, in charge of this conquest, would come back from having been successful, they would have a triumphal entry. They would enter, so it'd be a big event. Um, people would be out on the streets um, because it was all about celebrating the glory of you know Rome and and so then they would come in in the chariots and parading before them would be all of the spoils of the of the war um, including like they would be exotic animals from these like because it's you know conquered some strange off places there would of course be gold and silver and treasures and and strange you know fruits and just like all the stuff that that indicates like the 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 breadth and the um, intensity of the conquest, and then um, at the end would be all of the like kings and or not maybe there's probably not plural kings but the leaders and the king of the conquered people, and then behind them would be the emperor or the um, general or whatever on a chariot, moving through all the way till they get to the center of the city where. Um, they would slaughter the, the leaders of the kingdom in front of everyone, at least by some accounts. And so, um, this is, so this is a kind of a statement of glory, of power. Um, and so here you can see uh, the column of Trajan. I think it's about 30 feet high. And this is really interesting. So what's going on in this column, if you can see it, is it's actually like a scroll. So it's, you know, this is how tall it is. It's like a scroll, and there's just um, a story being told. You know, there's it's a, the scroll is like wrapping around it, going upward, and um, and it's telling about um, Trajan's conquests and war. And what's really interesting is here's one section of it, which is telling the story of his conquest of Jerusalem in seventy A.D. in seventy two A.D. Um, and you can see it. Here they are. They're carrying the menorah into Rome as part of its spoils of the conquest of Jerusalem. So the triumphal entry is is not just a, a Jewish sort of thing. It's something that everybody would have understood. Um, but Jesus' method of doing it is strange. We call this um, Palm Sunday because Palm Sunday is... Um, it represents the fact that they all had palm leaves. The palm leaves are supposed to uh, represent victory. Um, and um, so everybody's got their palm leaves out and they're shaking them. And they're saying um, to, uh, to uh, they're yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna means it's a, it's a, it's a, a Hebrew word. Or is it Aramaic? I can't really remember, um, but it, it's one of the two. And it basically means something like save or rescue. Um, and so it's kind of like saying salvation, you know. And um, that salvation is they believe, the crowd and the disciples, everyone that believes that Jesus is Messiah believes now the time has come. I mean, that's what this palm leaves are representing. And this is Jesus, and he accepts it. Um, the Pharisees, who do not think he's Messiah and do not much like him, um, say to him, you know, you got to stop this. Uh, the crowd, the disciples, they're calling you Messiah. They're, they're, they're saying that you're going to, I mean, you're not only messing with really, really bad religious territory, you're messing with political territory that you ought not. Because um, 
this is going to get us in trouble. This is going to get us really, really in trouble with Rome. And Jesus says, <laughs> if I told them to stop, the stones would begin to cry out. I mean, Jesus, again, this is Jesus being that cheeky, cantankerous, um, authoritative teacher. Um, they're celebrating because Messiah, King of Jerusalem, has come to his kingdom. You know, he's confirming what they're saying. But once again, they don't understand how it's going to happen. They just don't get it. Now, this is where things get really interesting. So, Jesus spends about a week, um, well, of course, a week, and he's, he's, um, so, I mean, you want to see Jesus at his, one of his most emblazoned and, um, and, and pugnacious, um, periods. This is it. So, it's what we call the temple debate. So, Passover is on a Thursday night, and he's coming on Sunday, and every night, every day, he goes into the temple, and he preaches and teaches, of course, and then he also, then they leave, and they go out, and they camp on the Mount of Olives outside of the city at night, Then they come back in, they go back out, and so during these days, as he's preaching in public in the temple, all the major groups come up and have an argue with him, argument with him. The Sadducees come and they question him. The Herodians and the um, and the Pharisees um, and you know all the groups that Jesus is. We don't have any zealots or anything, but most for for the most part, all the major groups that Jesus has sort of been frustrating and upsetting. They have these debates with them. Now we can't. Uh, we we've got to think in an ancient mindset here to understand um, the importance of these debates. These debates are not just, you know, academic. These debates are, they're in an honor-shame culture. And so they are meant to discredit Jesus in front of the people. That's their aim. The aim is that if they defeat Jesus in a debate, if they outsmart him, if they make him say something that he really can't say, um they will have not just won a debate, but they will have shamed him. And in an honor-shame culture, one way to think about it is that honor is not an unlimited quantity, okay? We kind of have a more capitalist mentality of honor, that honor is something that you can, like, generate by being honorable. But especially in these kinds of situations, honor is, is something transferable. So when Jesus... If Jesus loses in this debate, not only is he shamed, he's shamed because honor is taken away from him and is given to the person who's won or the group that's won. All right? And so Jesus is um, in these debates, and they're really about his, his validity as who he's claiming to be. And, um, you know, you'll read them. Um, but uh, the one that I want to focus on the most, because it really, it really cap all of the debate questions are really fabulous. Um, and then it ends with him going on this tirade of, of how things are going to go really, really bad for everyone. Um, but, uh, and then he also, you know, he predicts uh, the, the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple and, and this and that. But um, one of the questions that really pops out because it's, 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 it's quite, it's, it's almost, um, it's, it's pretty ingenious the way that it's set up. And that's the question about um, paying taxes to Caesar. Now, you need to remember that um, in the ancient world, this isn't like the IRS. This isn't like taxes today. This is taxes um, that is that all come together to to form a tribute payment to Rome as the the em empire. Okay. So remember, um, so remember how like when, when, a, when a city would declare it was no longer paying tribute, that would be an act of revolt. Well, that's what's behind this. So when people are paying taxes, um, yes, of course, it has a very similar um, use in the modern world that they're, you know, they're paying for 
social um, things to be, you know, like roads and stuff and, and the military. But it's also about showing that you are being um, obedient and faithful to the empire. And so this is a really, really big question because they're asking, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And it says, it says in the text, they're trying to trap him. Well, what's the trap? Well, if you say yes, you should, well, no, let's start the other way. If you say no, we should not pay taxes to Caesar. We are Israel, our allegiance is to God alone, we should not be ta paying taxes to, to Caesar. Well, you just said something that's grounds for revolt. You, because again, you stop paying taxes, that's saying, I revolt, I am not a part of this. That's what city-states would do. And this what, you know, that's what Babylon did to Assyria. That's what Jerusalem did to um, Antiochus. Um, and we went through all of that with um, in the intertestamental period. So if he says, no, we should not pay taxes, Caesar, he's, he's said something that's treasonous. On the other hand, if he says, yes, we should, he's saying he's not really pro-Israel. And of course he's saying he's not really Messiah. Because Messiah should not be pro-Rome. Messiah should be for Israel and honestly should be for the revolt of Israel against anything, any kingdom that tries to um, overtake them. And so it's a really good trap. It's a very good trap. And that's why I love Jesus' response. And he does this with all the questions. He, he just, he's like jiu-jitsu man or judo or something, Aikido. He just takes their trap and he turns it on them. All right, and it's great. He says, um, well, um, somebody give me a denarius or a coin. Or give me a coin, give me a, give me a coin. And so someone produces a coin and then Jesus says, see, and he holds it up. Whose image is on this coin? And they say Caesar's. Now, Jesus is invoking a lot of things here. And then he further says, give unto Caesar's what is Caesar's. Pay tribute unto Caesar's what is Caesar's and pay honor and tribute unto God what is God's. Now, Jesus is doing something extraordinarily clever. One, they're carrying around something with a graven image, which is expressly forbidden by the Ten Commandments. And it's not an image you know, and this, and you might say, like, well, yeah, but it's an image of an emperor. Yeah, but th we're talking about Roman emperors who had imperial cults that promoted worship of emperors. We have had emperors declare themselves gods and demand worship. We even looked at a passage of an inscription declaring Augustus Caesar was a god. You know, so I mean, it's no small thing to have an image of someone who claims to be a god in your pocket when you're a Jew and you're not supposed to have graven images. All right. So there's that, but then there's also give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but give unto God's God, what is God's well, what belongs to God? I don't know. Maybe Psalm 24, the Lord, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, you know, um, seeing all, all, all humans that live in, in the lands. I mean, everything belongs to God. Everything is for God's honor. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is saying pay taxes or not pay taxes. That's not his point. And he's certainly not speaking to some sort of, you know, modern 21st century issue of politics. He's speaking to an issue about Rome and Israel and is avoiding their trap by shaming them. What's your answer to the question? And why are you carrying around a graven image of a man, a man, who proclaims to be a god. It's just genius. And of course they go away and they are shamed. And remember, that means there's only so much honor to go around. You go and you challenge someone. And you got this airtight trap. And then he defeats you. He takes honor from you, leaving you in shame, and then he gains more. And so people are getting more and more impressed with Jesus while these people who hate him and want to defeat him and discredit him are becoming more shameful. So 
it's really upping the ante of the tension between Jesus and his enemies, which is, of course, why it's going to end the way it does. So that's what the week is leading up to Jesus, and then he gets more and more and more condemn, um, condemnatory, um, condemning with his words, until finally he says, you're all going to be destroyed. And, when, and he specifically, there's a whole chapter in Matthew, Matthew 23, on the Pharisees, where he just goes to town. Um, so um, everybody hates him. And that leads us to the Last Supper. Last Supper is the um, the uh, the night of the Passover. It's the Passover meal. I wish we could talk more about what a Passover meal would look like. Meal looks like, um, at least as far as we know today. But um, y'all can't. Um, don't have time. But um, it's important because you know Jesus has his last words. Um, some significant events are you know he washes the disciples' feet, which is I mean. That's the lowest servant's job. I mean, the lowest servant, the lowest household servant has to wash everyone's feet who come in. Because it's, you know, it's dusty, it's dirty, and they have sandals. And so, you know, they, they, they clean off the dust and the dirt when they come into the house because they don't want to bring that in. And so that's the lowest job. Um, and Jesus does that for his disciples. And then he says he's establishing a new covenant, covenantal theology, right? Got to keep that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to week two and or week three, um, and and look at covenantal theology because it's key. New covenant, Jesus says, he's establishing a new covenant on Passover, the Exodus, the time of the old the the the, not the old it is the old covenant, one of them, and in, in, in some ways the most important one. But it's 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 the covenant that Jesus or that Yahweh makes with Israel. Now Yeshua, whose name means Yahweh saves, is making a new covenant, and he establishes it in the sacrament of the Eucharist, which is, of course, this is my body, this is my blood given for you for the forgiveness of sins, new covenant in me. And so Jesus has basically set up everything that's about to happen. In, a, in, in, in very clear terms, Jesus has said, I am Messiah, and my time has come. And Israel's time has come. The time has come. But it's not what you think. It's not what you think. In some ways, it's a lot, lot worse. In some ways, it's a lot, lot better. And we'll continue on with that. Pretty much the worst part first in the next lecture. See you then.